Good afternoon to the New Businesses interview. Today we have our guest, uh, Mr. Michael Yanjanil, CEO FMO since uh, September 2021. Uh, Michael, CEO FMO, has over 15 years of experience in sustainable finance, having worked with McKinsey, Theodos Bank, and Bain where he founded and led the global sustainable finance practices. FMO is a Dutch development bank structured as a bilateral private sector international financial institution based in Hague, the Netherlands. FMO manages funds for the ministries of foreign affairs and economic affairs of the Dutch government to maximize the development impact of private sector investments. Michael has also held non-executive board positions in social enterprises and NGOs, including Oxfam International. Michael is an author of Future Leadership and personally commits to living a climate-neutral life with a goal of being cumulative net zero by 2030. So welcome, Michael, to our show. Thank you very much. Thank so how are you? I'm doing well. I'm very happy to be in Nepal. Okay, thank you so much. So, would you like to share uh, the purpose of your current Nepal visit? Of course. So, um, there is multiple purposes. Mm -hmm. One of them is uh, to visit NMB. Uh, we are a large shareholder in, in NMB and have a very long-standing relationship with NMB. So, I try to visit them at least once, uh, once a year because uh, we want to strengthen the relationship. And True. as we did yesterday um, in, the, in the joint meeting, we have uh, again showed our commitment for the future development of, of Nepal, mm -hmm. specifically in the area of uh, hydro, power and, and solar. So that's one. The second uh, one is I will be visiting one of the hydro uh, powers that we uh, that we finance. And the third one uh, might be interesting is there is a, a conference on uh, climate finance on Thursday, mm -hmm. um, also backed by um, the Nepalese Banking Association and IIN, the uh, initiative around uh, invest for impact in Nepal that we as FMO also back. So luckily I'll be able to cover all three in a week. Okay. And, um, leaves me unfortunately little time to visit Nepal as a country, which I know is beautiful because I've been here before, but um, but that's why I'm here. Okay, that's uh, great news and welcome to the Nepal. So with over 15 years of uh, experience in climate finance, uh, how have you seen the sector evolve? Uh, particularly since you joined FMO in 2021? So I think there is a clear development in the sector. Um, of course, we started um, financing wind parks and solar parks already way long ago. Um, and the adoption has been slow. I think one of the great things that um, COVID brought us is working from home, but also the notion of there are things will happen in, in the world that we cannot predict. And people see much more the risk of climate uh, change nowadays. So I think we've seen an uptick in uh, climate finance, but still there's a long, long way to go. Um, and that's also a reason why we come up with new structures, new ideas and, and conferences like this to create awareness and also to stimulate real active uh, finance uh, in it. Many countries, but also, of course, in, in Nepal. Mm -hmm. I know, how has been the experience in Nepal where uh, the ecosystem is dominated by financial service provider, uh, guided primarily by net profit and uh, high returns to the shareholders? Yeah. Look, it's, it's not easy to finance climate in a, in a sustainable way. And that is what we really try to promote. It's not just the financing of a hydro power solar park, but also doing it in um, good governance, good environmental and social criteria called ESG. And I think we are very uh, positive about the movements that we actually see, but it's, it's still varying. Uh, so the work that NMB has done on ESG and sustainability at large is, is very positive. And we really hope that many more will follow because otherwise you get climate finance, but in a way that might be not very sustainable. So for instance, talking about um, how do you deal with a hydro dam? How does it impact the local environment? A number of these things need to be taken into account. So we see movement, NMB is leading the way, uh, but there's still also there a long way, uh, long way to go. 
is the largest stakeholder of uh, NMB Bank. How does FMO support uh, the bank in managing local challenges such as uh, regulatory barriers, uh, risk management and economic uh, environment in Nepal? So we try to do that in, in multiple ways. So um, on one hand, we provide uh, technical assistance. That's basically we provide um, money, but also experienced people that help the bank grow further. So for instance, improve their ESG practices, improve the risk management side. But uh, also um, we try to help the Nepalese Bankers Association uh, to kind of take this forward. And also on the regulatory side, um, I've been talking to the Ministry of Finance uh, uh, when I'm here. I will be talking to the, the governor of the central bank also to discuss how can you build an environment which will be prosperous for the banks, but then of course also for Nepali business and Nepali uh, people and uh, in, in the broader sense. So it's not about the banks, it's about the, com the, the whole society that needs to profit from it. And that is what we try to do both on, on the regulatory effort, on the banking sector effort, and of course specifically with NMB. How would you assist the readiness of Nepal's financial ecosystem? for adopting climate aware uh, finance, both at the industry and regulatory levels? Well, I would say a start has made has been made. Um, last year, um, we, again with IIN, uh, set up a course together with the uh, University of Barcelona to educate 80, 80 bankers in Nepal on, on ESG. So there you see the steps being made. We had also discussions with the um, industry associations, uh, for instance, with IPAN, and I think steps are being made, but it's just a beginning of a longer journey. So again, I think there is understanding of how important it is. And I think also Nepal on the wider scale had made some serious commitments eh, to become net zero by 2045. I think the banks more and more understand that they have a big role to play and there's a, a big opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, how does FMO engage with Nepal's uh, regulators and government bodies to ensure uh, alignment with global banking standards and sustainable finance goals? Yeah. So the one element um, I mentioned was the discussions we have with the Minister of Finance and with the, uh, with the governor of the central bank. Um, so that, that is for us key. Um, but in the end, of course, they they're have their own autonomy and they have their own decisions to make. But we will try to help them. And I was very pleased to understand that also among the 80 bankers that worked on that was doing the EZ course, there was one person from the uh, Central Bank of Nepal. Mm -hmm. um, and that is also how we try to help it. Uh, we try to kind of set up education programs that are also open for uh, for people from that uh, that part. So. It is trying to get into the discussion, but not only discuss, but also help in, in practical ways. FMO holds a significant uh, stake in NMB Bank, which you said, we know it. So how do you evaluate the bank's performance in terms of sustainability, governance, and social impact as well? Well, I think we can be very proud of what uh, NMB has achieved. Mm -hmm. um, I think on all elements, uh, and I think the environmental social part has been uh, prominent all, all so many years. And also last year, uh, we did a deep dive in the governance part and it was very welcomed by, uh, by NMB. And we've uh, together, NMB made some changes uh, on behalf of that. So I think they're really moving to, to be best in class in Nepal. Um, well, they are actually. And I think that is also an, a role model for, for other banks. There can always be improvements, um, but if, you, if I look at the banking scene in, in Nepal, uh, they really stand out and that's something that makes us very proud. Okay. What initiatives is FMO driving within NMB Bank to promote green financing and sustainable banking practices in Nepal? So I think we are uh, we're doing a couple of things. Very practically, the, um, the, the technical assistance, eh, so the, the actual help. On, on both hydro and solar uh, that we announced this week um, is, I think, a very clear uh, effort. And of course, we also help them um, with actual loans uh, that are ring-fenced for climate finance, for instance, on, on the solar, uh, that will be the case. And next to that, we have discussions also with the board uh, of NMB, 
how they can you know make a next step in their whole climate finance in in whatever they do in the whole energy space particularly mm -hmm. and also outside so i think it's both helping to shape that future vision um, as well as helping on a practical level by uh, by financing a couple of the elements you also talk about the taxonomy uh, can you a bit explain about it yeah look the, the the green taxonomy that we understand is is up um, of course as a primary reason to increase transparency mm -hmm. so where does where do the banks stand uh, in uh, basically in their green finance and that's just the first step so transparency is key but it helps you also compare and it helps also banks set kind of standards or targets for for next level um, and again it's just the first step in a in the longer journey but it's i think it's a very helpful step Beyond NMB Bank, what uh, other sectors or projects in Nepal are of particular interest to FMO in terms of sustainability and impact that uh, you have been highlighting? So I think what we uh, do next to financing um, NMB, we finance uh, hydropower directly. And we, um, we are interested in how that whole energy field will develop. Um, worldwide, we also do a lot of agriculture. So for us, we are also looking at Nepal, what we can do in, in agriculture. There is no direct financing yet, but that will come. And of course, it, it already happens via NMB, but that's, that's of course indirect. And um, we have an investment in, uh, in private equity house Dolma, uh, and they are also uh, um, active in a, in a number of these sectors. So that is, for, that is how we kind of have our current portfolio. And we're very much looking to kind of build it out in, in Nepal because for us, Nepal is an important country. If you look at the development of Nepal, we see a lot of opportunities, mm -hmm. but there's still uh, work to do. Have you done any survey uh, on agriculture, any opportunities you see? What are those? Because uh, we talk a lot about solar energy, hydropower and other, yeah. not much about agriculture. So what is your take on this? No, that's a, that's a good question, which I cannot fully answer because that's where we are kind of investigating at, uh, at the moment. So we did not you yet do a kind of a full landscape overview that I can uh, that I can share. Can you share uh, the FMO's long-term vision uh, for NMB Bank and does FMO plan to expand its investment or influence in future? You mentioned a bit about certain sector, but yeah. So I mean, our long-term future for NMB is to basically go even beyond what they do now. Eh? So they are the lead uh, sustainability bank in Nepal. But we think um, they can kind of do even more on that. Eh? So we also had a good discussion in the board. Um, and that has to materialize how that actually plays out. But we are a long term supporter because otherwise mm -hmm. we would not uh, um, have the, the recent developments, uh, the signing of the, the TA on, on hydro and solar, for instance. So we are a long term supporter of NMB. Um, I think I cannot share anything particular on whether we want to kind of increase our stake or not, because I think that's commercially sensitive information. Mm -hmm. um, and I would probably be uh, corrected if I would say anything about, uh, about that. But in general, we have a very strong uh, long-term long -term supporter almost for two decades on, on NMB and its predecessor in the Clean Energy Bank. But I would appreciate if you at least could share some of the strategies of uh, FMO for having, you know, for navigating Nepal's uh, financial sector particularly considering the current economic and yeah. uh, political landscape. No, and the fact that beyond NMB we're very supportive of Nepal is, I think, best illustrated by the, uh, the initiative of IIN, uh, Invest in, uh, in Impact in Nepal, mm -hmm. because we put some serious money uh, to it, together with our British colleagues and our Swiss, uh, Swiss friends. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also for a long-term development of, of Nepal. So. When we started um, this initiative, there were, I think, three DFIs, uh, Development Finance Institutes, active in Nepal. And now there are uh, about 10. And I think you have recently featured uh, some of that in, yes. uh, in your magazine, which I think is very interesting for, for viewers to kind of actually read. Um, so that we would not do if we would not see a growth potential of Nepal. This is one of the only countries in the world where we do it in this way. So this is really special. and that gives us, uh, I think, illustrates of the commitment of FMO as a Dutch development bank to the development of, uh, of Nepal. And that is, of course, the financial system is very important in many countries, but also in Nepal, because the money will make things move. 
And that means if there is and if there's insufficient foreign investments into Nepal, it will not accelerate. So I think it will be definitely good um, to build out that further. And also there is a long-term commitment. It's not like just one or two years. This program has been running for three years now, and we're actively looking at how to bring that further. So I hope that gives a bit of a sense of beyond NMB, how FMO is a, a long-term uh, supporter of, of Nepal at large. From your perspective, what role uh, should private sector finance play in achieving Nepal's development goals, particularly in the areas like you have been talking clean energy, agriculture and small and medium enterprises growth? Yeah. No, I think the, the idea that governments on its own can finance the sustainability uh, development goals by 2030 is naive. Yeah. Private sector is, is crucial. Uh, so we're very happy to see that the private sector is relatively active in, uh, in Nepal, if you compare that with, with other countries in, in Southeast Asia. And that's good. Uh, so the, the groundwork is, uh, is absolutely there. And I think um, if the private sector puts its shoulders, especially on, the, uh, on a number of key sectors, uh, uh, green and agriculture to be specifically, and green is and renewable energy, I think that will help the development further. And then the question is, how will it be done uh, to look at the ESG standards that I talked before? I think it's very important that the private sector understands that we need to care for the planet on the longer term. So it's not just for the agriculture for the next three or five years, but we all want our children of our children to have a, you know, a, a good life as well. So if the private sector puts his shoulders behind it, I think it, Nepal can go and accelerate its development uh, absolutely. And it's needed. The government won't be able to do it on its own. So based on your experience, um, uh, yeah, uh, in your uh, personal life, uh, you and your family aim to live uh, a climate neutral life and be net zero by uh, 2030. Yeah. Could you explain what it means to live, uh, live climate neutral and how you plan to achieve that net zero? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so I've tried to reduce my personal footprint. Okay. Um, so I've been driving an electric vehicle for over 10 years already. We were in the fortunate position to um, build our own house and we've built that very sustainable. And that's also f almost 15 years ago, uh, solar panels on a roof to generate electricity for one and a half household. So for ourselves, but also for more. So we, we generate electricity. We don't, we don't use it. Um, I've started uh, to also um, be vegetarian. Okay. Uh, so reduce the consumption of, of uh, heavy, especially kind of uh, beef, which is a, a big footprint, uh, as we all know. Yeah. So all those things I've tried to set in place. Um, and then there's still a little bit left. Um, and when I was talking to all the big banks about becoming net zero, I thought, but I'm personally not net zero. I need to practice what I preach. So to compensate for the last uh, bit, because I could not eliminate everything, um, yeah, I, I bought a small forest uh, in uh, in the Netherlands, and that forest I'm I'm cultivating to basically capture uh, the CO2 that I cannot uh, avoid. That's a great news, Isla. Motivating and learning for all of us. These were a few of my questions. Uh, anything else would you like to yeah. add? Bin, you have been like in Nepal on a, on a personal capacity 23 years ago and now you're a banker. Yeah. Uh, as a banker, um, uh, what changes you have seen uh, the way banking has, is being done in Nepal over the years? And as a senior banker, uh, what, how the banking I mean, should we move forward in Nepal? I mean, what yeah. would be a suggestion? Uh, when I say the way of doing bankers, Nepal is predominantly a collateral based lending banking. Yeah. You don't have, you know, um, um, very traditional, no project financing. No project financing all except time. in hydro power to some yeah. extent. So, um, yeah. How do you evaluate the banking system in Nepal? And what, what if you could change, what could be it? those points, so those major changes? Yeah. Look, I think, I think there is um, a lot of good things that are developed and 
if I look, for instance, let me take out a couple of uh, items here. Um, so, for instance, financial inclusion. Uh, the financial literacy has gone up, but there's still 30% of people in Nepal that do not have access to finance. Yes. So I think that is, a, that is something that needs to be developed. But how? And then if you look at digitalization, because I think that's there the key, of course, uh, Nepal also made, made some serious steps. Um, I understood that the mobile penetration is now 80%. I mean, there are mobile, there are mobile, more mobile phones in Nepal than there are people, but that's because a lot of yes. people have two. Uh, so there's 80% that do have a mobile phone. So you will need to increase the mobile phone penetration in order to also increase the financial inclusion. But there's still a gap of 10% of people that actually have a mobile phone and don't have uh, fine access to finance. So that's kind of, I think, on the retail side, a big, uh, big way to uh, to move still. Um, on the on the business side, it's. Uh, uh, we are so we are so specialized it's it's not easy to give a kind of a broad stroke but i think the whole point of um creating more project finances um uh, creating more and now it's i will address the whole point of esg again and the notion of esg in banking it's not a cost some people also in business think it's a cost but if you look at the longer term lifespan eh, for instance if you're in a man manufacturing if you just think about reducing waste, reducing waste is good for the environment, but it's also good for your cost. And so need, also bankers need to think a bit more creative in, uh, in, that, in that space. Um, and I think um, if you look at the position of Nepal, uh, there's a dependency of India, of course, and there is also a conscious choice that needs to be made in uh, do, do you diver diversify your business or is it, is it good as it is? That is for me not completely clear, uh, clear yet. Okay, second question is uh, the government of Nepal has now begun the, the sovereign rating process and it has, has, has hired Fitch uh, for doing Nepal's country rating for the first time. Uh, as international financial institutions, uh, when you see Nepal, uh, when you decide to do business in Nepal or what uh, Nepali uh, bank and financial institutions wants to uh, get funds from institutions like Nepal, how important this credit rating for for for, for international institutions like Nepal and why Nepal should do this this, this sovereign rating now and how why it is so important for Nepal also? Look, there are a couple of things. We when we start investing somewhere, you look at at the macroeconomic perspective, of course, but we are a development bank, so that means that if the situation is at high risk, it does not mean that we're going we're not going there. It's almost kind of the other way around, because we go where others stop. And that's also why you will find us, um, and you can look on the internet exactly where we are, you will find us in, in very risky countries. But of course, we then look at, okay, what is the company that we are actually financing? So if that has a stable track record and um, you know has a good outlook, then we are willing to take that risk. So we look at, we look at the macroeconomic, of course, uh, currency situations are also very relevant. Regulations are very relevant. Um, there are many, many aspects um, beyond kind of just a rating because a rating is just is just a rating. So it's I fully understand that it's very important to attract um, foreign investments in general. But we, as a development bank, look a look at it a little bit differently. Thank you very much. Anything else you would like to highlight that I was supposed to ask or I could not ask? Anything you think important, please share. No, I think um, for the viewer, I think it's very important to understand that everybody can contribute. Uh, so it's a, a bank like NMB, it's a magazine like yourself, but everybody has choices to make. And I would wish that everybody makes a choice with a longer term view uh, for the for the greater good, because if we do that, then we will move this planet into a much better space, and that will benefit everybody in Nepal. Thank you very much for your time and this insightful interview. Thank, thank you, you for much. taking the time, and thank you for taking the time as well. Namaste.